We're currently in Season 2 of Solving JFK. Season 1 of the podcast looked at the question of whether the Warren Report was correct that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone to kill President John F. Kennedy and Officer J.D. Tippett. Right now, in Season 2, we're going deep on Lee Harvey Oswald's background, including his childhood, his service in the Marines, and his time in the Soviet Union. Now that we have the Oswald background that most people are not as familiar with out of the way, the rest of this season will be focused on the more well-known parts of this case. In this episode, we cover the Oswald family's arrival in America, Lee's potential debriefing by the CIA, his multiple run-ins with the FBI, and Oswald's mysterious new friend. George de Morenschild. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. This is Solving JFK. I'm your host, Matt Crumpton. On May 22nd, 1962, the Oswald family left Minsk for Moscow. They stayed in Moscow for eight days before traveling west via train through Minsk, Poland, and Germany before catching a steamship in Rotterdam to go to New York. They arrived in New York on June 13th. Oswald was not arrested when he made it back to the States. Instead, he was welcomed in Hoboken, New Jersey by Spas T. Rakin, who was the Secretary General of the American Friends of Anti-Bolshevik Nations, an anti-communist organization with intelligence ties. The Oswalds had only $63 to their name when they landed in America. Rakin got them a hotel near Times Square through the New York Department of Welfare, and Lee's brother Robert wired them $200 so that they could fly back to Fort Worth the next day. If Oswald was a genuine Marxist, it does seem strange that the head of an anti-communist organization would be the one greeting him. On the other hand, Rakin was a member of the Traveler's Aid Society, which had been contacted by the State Department to help the Oswalds. Rakin says that he was chosen to assist them because he was a native Russian speaker, and they were under the impression that Marina spoke only Russian. While it's true that the group that Rakin was associated with, the American Friends of Anti-Bolshevik Nations, did have intelligence ties, that doesn't necessarily mean that Rakin himself was an intelligence asset. For his part, Rakin told a local newspaper, quote, If I worked for the CIA, I'd have a government pension. There are many myths that have been associated with my contact with Lee Harvey Oswald. The biggest myth is that I had been an agent of the CIA. This is the most untrue myth that was created by writers. My obligation was to meet him, assist him through customs. Once I delivered him to the office, my job was finished with him. He was passed to another worker and I had no more contact with him. The only clear intelligence connection that I was able to find for Spas Rakin is a declassified letter written to him by Alan Dulles' assistant which thanked Rakin for sending three letters as well as reports about the American Friends of Anti-Bolshevik Nations on June 30th, 1959. 
So it is true that Rakin wrote at least once and likely on multiple occasions to Alan Dulles, and Dulles's secretary acknowledged those letters. This is one more of those instances in the case where there's not really any hard proof of shenanigans, but there's just enough innuendo to leave the door open. I tend to take Rakin at his word that he didn't have any special CIA mission when it came to picking up the Oswalds, because that just seems to make sense given all of the surrounding facts. Then again, not everyone is sending materials and getting responses from the director of the CIA, so I understand why people look at him skeptically. Regardless of whether Oswald actually had intelligence connections, We would expect him to be debriefed by the CIA when he made it back to America to ask him questions about what he saw in the Soviet Union, just like they asked many other foreign travelers about what they saw abroad. The official position of the CIA is that they didn't debrief Lee Harvey Oswald when he returned to America because Oswald was a Marine and it would have been the Navy's job to interview him. The reality was that Oswald had been dishonorably discharged and was now a civilian returning from the Soviet Union. Even if the interview was basic and routine, we would expect the CIA to have reached out to Oswald. But that never happened. On the other hand, in 1978, the House Select Committee on Assassinations interviewed CIA officer Donald Deniselia who said that he received a field report from the New York City field office about a Marine defector who had worked at a radio plant in Minsk and recently returned to the United States with his family. Deniselia's job at the CIA was to keep tabs on technical and industrial progress in the Soviet Union, like the radio and television factory where Oswald worked in Minsk. So it makes sense that Deniselia would have seen this routine debriefing report. Of course, this document that Deniselia claims to have seen, which would prove that Oswald was debriefed by the CIA, is nowhere to be found. All we have is the HSCA testimony of Donald Deniselia. But former CIA director Richard Helms told PBS Frontline in their 1993 documentary that Oswald was never debriefed by the CIA. On the day Helms did his interview with PBS, historian and author John Newman was present on the set and had an interesting exchange with Helms in between filming. Newman asked Helms, quote, Mr. Director, What would be so bad about the CIA debriefing Oswald? Is that not your job? Doesn't it therefore look bad when you say you did not? Richard Helms then thought it over and asked the PBS cameraman to start rolling again because he wanted to change his answer to be that the agency did debrief Oswald. The PBS crew didn't take Helms up on the offer to shoot a new scene and his original answer that there was no debriefing stayed in the film. But the fact that Helms was ready to change his position on a dime is a little bit surprising. While it's unclear if the CIA debriefed Oswald, we know that the FBI did. This isn't surprising since on May 5th, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover sent a memo about Lee Harvey Oswald to the special agent in charge in the Dallas office that said, quote, You should be alert for subjects return to the United States and immediately upon his arrival, you should thoroughly interview him to determine whether he was recruited by Soviet intelligence or made any deals with the Soviets in order to obtain permission to return to the United States. Even J. Edgar Hoover was skeptical of the speed with which the Oswalds got out of the USSR. The FBI called Robert Oswald's house the first week Lee was back and asked him to meet with them at their Fort Worth office. On June 26, 1962, 
Oswald sat for a two-hour-long interview so that the FBI agents could gather the information that was requested by Director Hoover. Oswald told the agents that he had not renounced his citizenship in the Soviet Union and that he was never recruited by Soviet intelligence. He also said that he made the trip there because, quote, he wanted to see the country. The FBI interviewed Oswald again two weeks later on July 6th. Then on July 19th, FBI agent James Hosty opened a file on Marina Oswald as a potential Soviet sleeper agent. Hosty told the Assassination Records Review Board that the FBI was more interested in Marina as a KGB sleeper agent than they were in Lee. On August 16th, FBI agents John Fain and Arnold Brown met with Oswald again for the third time. They were waiting in a car outside of his apartment and asked Oswald to get in the car when he arrived home from his welding job. After speaking with him, the agents believed that Oswald was arrogant, but they didn't think he was violent. So on August 30th, 1962, Agent Fain closed the FBI file on Lee Harvey Oswald. For the next seven months, there are no interviews of Oswald, his neighbors, or his employers. The file on Marina, on the other hand, remained open on pending inactive status. On September 7th, FBI Director Hoover sent Agent Fain's report on Oswald to the CIA with a note that said, For your information, I am enclosing communications which may be of interest to you. Before the HSCA, the Church Committee was investigating the activities of American intelligence agencies. Ex-FBI agent Carver Gayton said in a sworn affidavit to the Church Committee that fellow FBI agent James Hostie told him that Lee Harvey Oswald was a potential security informant for an older FBI agent who had deactivated Oswald's file as an informant just before he retired. It appears that Gayton is referring to Agent Fain, who closed Oswald's file before he retired in the fall of 1962. Gayton also said that Hosty told him that he had listed Oswald as a potential security informant, but he wasn't successful in reaching Oswald to discuss the possibility with him of him being an informant. On June 14th, 1962, Robert Oswald picked up Marina, Lee, and baby June at Love Field in Dallas. The trio moved in with Robert, his wife, Veda, and their three-year-old daughter and infant son. After about a month, Robert asked his brother's family to move out because his two-bedroom, one-bath house was feeling a little too crowded. The Oswald family then moved in with Lee's mom, Marguerite, at apartment number 101 at the Rotary Apartments in Fort Worth. That didn't last very long. On August 10th, Marina, Lee, and June moved out of Marguerite's Fort Worth apartment. They were always arguing with her. And they moved into a bungalow at 2703 Mercedes Street in Fort Worth. Soon after, Lee began looking for work at the Texas Employment Commission, ultimately landing a position at Leslie Welding. When Oswald was at the Employment Commission, he mentioned that he wanted to find some people who spoke Russian because his wife could only speak Russian. Annie Smith of the Employment Commission gave Oswald the contact information for Peter Paul Gregory, a native Russian who was a petroleum engineer and taught Russian language at the public library. Oswald had collected scraps of paper and some pages of a diary that he wanted to have typed up as his memoirs on his time in Russia. This is apparently a different document from Oswald's historic diary. Oswald paid Gregory to have 10 pages typed up. 
In late August of 1962, Peter Gregory invited the Oswalds to his house for dinner, where he introduced them to George Bow, one of the pillars of the Dallas White Russian community. As a reminder, the White Russians were a group of people from Russia who fled their homeland after the Bolshevik Revolution led to a communist regime. So the white Russians were stridently anti-communist and anti-Marxist. Many in the white Russian community were provided with assistance from the Tolstoy Foundation, a resettlement organization for Russian refugees. The Tolstoy Foundation was funded by the CIA. We don't know how many people in the Dallas white Russian community were connected to the Tolstoy Foundation. Incidentally, the Russian Orthodox Church in Dallas also received CIA funds. Given that the CIA provided these funds, it's fair to ask if the CIA got something back for their investment, although we don't have any proof that there was ever any sort of quid pro quo. In mid-September of 1962, Lee Harvey Oswald met George de Morenschild for the first time. De Morenschild is an enigmatic and important character in the JFK assassination whose intentions are much debated. De Morenschild and his friend, Colonel Lawrence Orloff, drove to Fort Worth and showed up at Oswald's apartment on Mercedes Street without notice. When Marina answered the door, de Morenschild gave the name George Bow as a reference. Bow was the white Russian elder who Marina and Lee had recently met at Peter Gregory's house. Marina then invited de Morenschild and Orloff inside. When Lee came home from work, he spoke with the men, at first in English and then in Russian. After this visit, de Morenschild invited Marina, Lee, and baby June to come to his house and meet his wife, Jean. Here's how de Morenschild himself described this meeting. Well, we met Oswald uh, uh, about uh, in uh, in the summer of last, uh, 1962, when we heard that uh, there was a young couple we arrived from Russia and were in very difficult financial condition. So a friend of mine and myself drove to Fort Worth and uh, found this tenement house where he was living. You'll notice in the clip that de Morenschild doesn't say who it is that told him about the Oswalds. And that is a matter of some dispute. So who was George de Morenschild? And why did he decide to befriend Lee Harvey Oswald? De Morenschild was born in Russia, and his father was the governor of Minsk before the 1917 Russian Revolution. His dad was also the director of the oil interests of Russian nobility. This is how de Morenschild got the nickname The Baron. He came to America in 1938, settling on Long Island, where he met and befriended Jackie Kennedy's mother. After working for some oil companies, de Morenschild earned a master's degree in petroleum geology from the University of Texas in 1944. After that, he worked for oil companies in Venezuela and Colorado before forming numerous oil partnerships, at first in Wyoming and Texas, and later in Haiti, Togoland, Nigeria, Ghana, Mexico, and Cuba. De Morenschild's work across the globe led him to be asked to go to Yugoslavia on behalf of United States governmental entity, the International Cooperation Administration. The ICA sent de Morenschild to Yugoslavia so that he could observe the development of oil resources there. In 1957, when de Morenschild returned to Dallas from Yugoslavia, he was interviewed by J. Walton Moore from the CIA's Dallas office. One of Moore's job duties was to contact people who had traveled abroad so that he could ask them what they had seen. 
DeMoran Schultz submitted multiple written reports to Moore about Yugoslavia. Later, Moore contacted DeMoran Schultz on several other occasions after he had traveled abroad and returned. J. Walton Moore of the CIA even occasionally dined at DeMoran Schultz's house. In 1961, George and his wife Jean began a 1,200-mile walking trip from Eagle Pass, Texas, through Mexico and on to Panama. On April 17th, the day of the Bay of Pigs invasion, DeMoran Schilt happened to be in Guatemala City at the same time as the Americans and Cuban exiles who were in the middle of launching the strikes. DeMoran Schultz told the Warren Commission that it was a coincidence that he happened to be at the American base for the Bay of Pigs invasion on the day that it happened. When George and Gene returned to Dallas, they put on a public showing of some of the home movies that they made when they were walking across Latin America. J. Walton Moore was in attendance to see the films. So George de Morenschild was an aristocratic international oil man with Russian roots and CIA connections. But that doesn't explain why he would go and befriend the Oswalds. So why did he? What made George de Morenschild stop by Mercedes Street that day in 1962? De Morenschild told the Warren Commission that he didn't remember who gave him the address for the Oswalds in Fort Worth. He thought it may have been George Bowe, or it could have been his lawyer, Max Clark. He just wasn't sure. DeMoran Schilt also told the Warren Commission that he asked J. Walton Moore in 1962 if it was all right for him to know Oswald because he was worried that the Oswalds may be Soviet spies given how easy it was for Marina to leave the Soviet Union compared to other people he knew. DeMoran Schultz said the CIA man, Moore, told him, quote, Oswald is a harmless lunatic. J. Walton Moore later denied ever speaking to DeMoran Schultz about Lee Harvey Oswald in any way. On the other hand, DeMoran Schultz told author Edward Epstein that an associate of Moore's contacted him, gave him Oswald's address, and suggested that he should meet Oswald. In exchange, DeMoran Schilt asked for the State Department to help him with an oil exploration contract in Haiti, which he did, in fact, end up receiving. DeMoran Schilt told Epstein, quote, I would never have contacted Oswald in a million years if J. Walton Moore, the CIA, had not sanctioned it. The HSCA looked into this question of what was the real extent of DeMorne Schultz's CIA ties with J. Walton Moore. They found that Moore had written a memo on April 13, 1977, to rebut a local Dallas television report saying that Oswald was employed by the CIA and knew J. Walton Moore. In that memo, Moore said that he had only spoken to George de Morenschild twice in his entire life, in 1958 to discuss mainland China, and in 1961 when the de Morenschilds showed a film of their Latin American walking tour. When the HSCA was able to see the rest of DeMoran Schultz's CIA file, they found proof that J. Walton Moore wasn't telling the entire story about his interactions with George DeMoran Schultz. For example, there's a May 1st, 1964 memo where J. Walton Moore wrote that he knew DeMoran Schultz since 1957 and confirmed that he did request information from him when he got back from Yugoslavia. That same memo from Moore says that he saw DeMoran Schultz several times in 1958 and 1959. When the HSCA interviewed Moore, he admitted that contrary to his 1977 memo, he did 
have periodic contact with Demorenschild over the years. So we have another factual dispute. There's the Warren Commission testimony where Demorenschild says, I asked the guy I know at CIA if it was okay to hang out with Oswald, and he said fine. And then there's what Demorenschild told Edward Epstein, where he says, The CIA guy told me to go meet Oswald, and I did it in exchange for an oil contract in Haiti. The HSCA summarized why this question is so important. Quote, Speculation has continued about Oswald's relationship to DeMorenschild because of the contrast of the backgrounds of the two men. DeMorenschild was described as sophisticated and well-educated, moving easily in the social and professional circles of oil men and the so-called white Russian community, many of whom were avowed right-wingers. Oswald's lowly background did not include much education or influence, and he was shunned by the same Dallas Russian community that embraced DeMorenschild. To recap, we have a wealthy, sophisticated, CIA-connected, 51-year-old international oil man who also is of Russian nobility and hangs out with right-wing Russians going out of his way to befriend a 23-year-old avowed Marxist attempted defector who has no money and no prospects. There are no examples that I was able to find of DeMorenschild having similar charity cases. It would be plausible that he was just helping the Oswalds out of altruism if this was something that DeMorenschild did frequently. But it wasn't. Oswald seems to be a one-off, bizarre friendship for the Baron. J. Walton Moore wasn't the only CIA contact that George de Morenschild had. Going back to 1953, George's brother, Dmitry von Morenschild, worked for Radio Free Europe, the CIA-sponsored propaganda arm that broadcasted anti-communist programming into Eastern Europe. Dmitry was also the editor of a monthly journal called Russian Review, which was subsidized by the CIA in the 1950s and 60s. Alan Dulles, who would go on to be the director of the CIA and the most active Warren commissioner, submitted multiple articles that Dmitry von Morenschild published in Russian Review. The other editor who worked with Dmitry on Russian Review was William Chamberlain, who would go on to become very close friends with Alan Dulles, exchanging over 50 letters with him. In addition to this loose connection to Alan Dulles, declassified CIA files show a potential direct connection. In 1954, a young oil lawyer named Herbert Itkin obtained a meeting in Philadelphia with then-CIA director Alan Dulles to provide information about what he thought was anti-American activity within the international law firm where Itkin worked. Dulles got Itkin's phone number and address, and a few months later, Itkin was contacted by a man named Philip Harbin, who identified himself as, quote, from that man in Philadelphia. Now, there is an internal CIA memo from March 18th, 1969, that says that it can completely made this story up. But on the other hand, during the HSCA hearings, we learned that CIA officer William Gaudet knew George de Morenschild as Philip Harbin, the same man Alan Dulles had introduced Herbert Itkin to to help him with his international oil problem. Now, maybe it's nothing that Alan Dulles published articles in DeMorenschild's brother's publication, or that Dulles was close friends with DeMorenschild's brother's co-editor, or that there's a declassified CIA memo that says Alan Dulles specifically referred an oil lawyer to who we later learned was George DeMorenschild. 
It's important to keep an open mind and not get carried away by these mere connections that don't necessarily prove anything. Still, if what Herbert Itkin says is true, it proves that George de Morenschild had a close relationship with the local CIA office in Dallas and also at the very top of the agency with Alan Dulles. Next time on Solving JFK, we continue looking at Oswald's life in Dallas with the White Russians, including Marina and Lee's introduction to someone who would become a key part of their lives, Ruth Payne. If you heard anything that you believe is out of context, or if you have additional information to offer, you can let us know at solvingjfkpodcast at gmail.com. Please provide citations to the record for any fact that you're relying on. For transcripts, sources, and official podcast merchandise, visit SolvingJFKPodcast.com. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thanks for listening. Visit SolvingJFKPodcast.com for more information. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just.